This is Five Live Formula One with Jenny Gow. Hello and welcome to the second practice session of a brand new season. The music's pumping out just to my right. There's even a shawarma stand in the paddock. Uh, and there's some tea being served um, and there are thousands of twinkling lights because the sun is starting to set here in Bahrain. The temperatures, I have to say, are pretty much the same as I think it's going to be at home. It's chilly. I wish I'd bought an extra layer, uh, but feeling nice and snug and warm in the commentary box, we have Sam Bird, former Mercedes test driver and reserve driver, and now Jaguar Formula E driver. And we have Jack Nichols as well. Go on, rub it in. How warm is it? Uh, Delightful. 20.9 20 degrees, 20.8 degrees in here. Oh, we've got a heady. we've got a live readout, so we are we are warmer <laughs> than the air outside, but only by three degrees. Yeah, I've had to change my setup. Um, I've I've gone for a jumper because wow. I was t-shirting before. Now I've I've moved on. I really wish I stole that jumper before we went on air. Never mind. I have a cardigan on. It's fine. Uh, yes, as I said, the rippling um, facades of the paddock hospitality buildings are to my left at the moment there's a gaggle of people to my right above the garages in the um, complex above the pit lane who are all looking down trying to spot somebody famous John Lacey there in the Ferrari hospitality to my left all sorts of great and good have returned back to the paddock for what should be a fabulous season and Jack I think it's fair to say that we still don't know the real competitive order of these cars. No, this will be the the big litmus test before qualifying tomorrow because we will see some qualifying runs later on in the next hour or so. And that's going to be very exciting. I think the, the general feeling seems to be getting clearer, doesn't it? That Mercedes, uh, sorry, that uh, Mercedes are not on the pace and that Red Bull are the favourites, but Ferrari might be close. That does feel like a, a truism. But, uh, which I don't think is the right word to use, but we'll have more evidence at, uh, at, the, at the end of this session. Sam, certainly from talking to people in between the last session and, and this one that's coming up, there is a feeling that Mercedes is still holding their cards close to their chest. And I think it might be just one of disbelief that Mercedes have not turned up with a really good car. Is, is that what your understanding is becoming? Yeah, that's absolutely correct, Jenny. We, I was speaking to Antonio Giovinazzi in the paddock just now, who's also racing in Formula E as well as reserving for Ferrari. And he and the Ferrari, the entire lot of Ferrari, seem to think that Mercedes are just playing. And, and I'm stood there thinking, I don't think they are. Because looking at the car, it doesn't, it doesn't look fun to drive now we've seen that they're using two different floors at the moment they're trying things out George is trying one Lewis is trying another but it's not comfortable for them out there um, and I think people are, are, are just so used to being them being up there that they can't believe that they're struggling do you think this is the session Sam that we actually will get a proper gauge or is it not really going to be until qualifying tomorrow you're not really going to know absolutely everything until qualifying, but certainly this is the session where we'll find the most out of all the practice sessions. Uh, Andrew Benson, BBC's Chief F1 writer, is also with us for this uh, for this free practice too. Lewis Hamilton just warming up his hands before he gets into the car. Anything standing out as surprising so far or anything that's super interesting to Mr Benson? I wouldn't say surprising, Jenny. And just on Mercedes, I think you know it, we may find as the season goes on that they have designed a really great car, but at the moment they can't make it work in the way they want it to. That's for, that is for sure. And they feel that Red Bull and Ferrari are a good way ahead of them at the moment. Uh, whatever, whatever, Ferrari um, having been punched so many times over the last few years, are finding themselves difficult, finding difficult to believe that that is where Mercedes think they are. They're behind. Rebel and Ferrari, and I suppose that is in itself that is quite a shock. As for the rest of the field, um, we really do have to wait and see. Um, it was still too early to say in the first session. And of course, the other thing to say about this session coming up is after they do the qualifying runs, they'll do race simulation runs, and uh, hopefully, we'll also get a good picture of relative competitiveness there. They're off there sometimes more revealing than the qualifying runs, actually, today anyway because uh, people can still play with fuel loads in the qualifying sims, but they can't do that so much in the race sims. 
Wind's picking up a little bit. We had really strong gusts of wind around here yesterday. Let's see if that affects the running of these cars as well. One man that needs a better session, Valtteri Bottas at Alfa Romeo. He was very limited in his running in free practice. One cars, Jack Nichols, are heading towards the pit exit. Yep, they're already out. Green light on at the end of the pit lane. A few stopping to do practice starts on the right-hand side. But we did get... What I didn't quite uh, understand was we got practice starts at the end of that first free practice session despite there being maybe it's not an official practice start box on the on the left hand side on the exit of the pit lane but plenty of people are doing it normally if you can do practice starts you don't then get to do them at the at the end of the session but anyway that's neither here nor there really Carlos Sainz out onto the circuit in that beautifully colored Ferrari it's like a, what is it more of a maroon than than previous years takes me back to the early 1990s when that was the sort of color I think probably 96 was maybe the last time they ran that sort of deeper, darker red. Even by 96, it had got a little bit brighter. So uh, very, very cool as they celebrate 75 years of uh, Ferrari this year. Yeah, we ran a similar kind of, albeit a more glossy effect in 2017 to, to celebrate the 70th anniversary in the WEC. So it reminds me a little bit of that. A lot of anniversaries at Ferrari as well, because... There's all you can have an anniversary for anything. There's there's X amount of years since Enzo Ferrari started Scuderia Ferrari, in which he was running Alfa Romeos, and then about five years after that, there's another anniversary, which is the first Ferrari car. It's yeah, not any any opportunity to celebrate Ferrari is a good yeah. opportunity, right? Absolutely, no, I don't disagree. Uh, Sites coming up into turn eleven. There was quite a lot of work going on on both Lewis Hamilton and Max Verstappen's car. Both cars were still right up on the on the sort of high jacks with with work going on 15 cars have headed out onto the circuit uh, Carlos Sainz is the sound you can hear in the aforementioned Ferrari as he gets on the power coming down towards the final corner but it'll be interesting to see how long until Max Verstappen and uh, Lewis Hamilton head out onto the circuit a reminder it was Pierre Gasly who was quickest in practice this morning as he gets on the power and comes down the start finish straight over the line flashes underneath our commentary box here in Bahrain in the main grandstand in fact we're directly opposite the Ferrari team with their new outfits as well a sort of red shirt with a black stripe across the across the chest area and Sainz makes his way through the right hander of three and up towards Turn 4 with 57 minutes and 20 seconds to go. The two Red Bulls, the Mercedes of Hamilton, the Alpine of Alonso and the uh, Alfa Tauri of Sonoda are the drivers that have are yet to leave the pits. So when these new cars came out, I was reading a lot online about the visibility of the cars and how it's going to be on, uh, on street circuits. Now, with my experience in Formula E in the Generation 2 car that we drive, I think that our visibility in, in Formula E is far worse than the visibility in Formula 1s albeit they're going a lot quicker but from the driver's eye perspective that we saw in Free Practice 1 I don't think visibility will be too much of an issue for the remainder of the season uh, Science is now coming through the left-hander of Turn 11 where his teammate Leclerc span earlier on kept running on those on those same tyres for the, for the rest of the session uh, Science now quickest in the middle sector 2 as he comes down towards the final corner. Charles Leclerc spun earlier on, not span. I was talking about his wings. I was talking about the front and rear wing span rather than... Uh, I presume you don't call it a wing span on a Formula One car. Anyway, signs across the line now. That's my first. Andrew Benson teaches me what words are of the, of the season. 56 minutes to go. And Sainz does a uh, one minute... 33.837 and Leclerc's going quicker than him at the moment through the middle sector he now comes down towards the final turn as a driver you love a night session Jack because the tyre is in a much happier place it lasts longer it shifts the balance a little bit more towards understeer so if you've got a nervous rear in the heat this will make the car a little bit more neutral and it's obviously a lot, lot quicker because the track is at a cooler temperature and it's just nice to be able to push constantly. And when you're in these sort of, because it's not 
it's it's going tonight, isn't it? So the track is kind of constantly changing in these sessions as well. I mean, I know a track's always changing anyway, but is it more dramatic in these conditions? It, you certainly feel like it's just getting a bit quicker, a bit quicker, a bit quicker as the as the temperature drops. There is a point where it plateaus a little bit, but we will see throughout this session that the track just continues to improve. Well, that lap time of a... Well, Leclerc's now done a 1 minute 33.121. So that's already one second faster than the quickest time we had at the end of FP1. There's also been Formula 3 practice, I think, out on, on circuit. I don't think it was qualifying. I didn't really uh, look, but um, I think it was practice. Uh, Gasly is now... Uh, out on circuit his teammate Yuki Tsunoda is coming into the final corner getting to wind up a lap they've actually swapped their um, T-cam colours it's the only time I mention it I promise in this session but Gasly is now black T-cam and uh, Tsunoda is now yellow and that's changed from last year anyway the Japanese driver comes down towards turn one where he superbly lunged Sebastian Vettel last year and goes a couldn't quite tell if it was a lockup or just a bit of a skid from underneath the car. That looked like a front lockup going to, I'm carrying too much speed, and then a little bit of an oversteer to not being able to turn in at the apex. 54 minutes to go. Sonoda now through turn four. He's looking a bit loose on the exit of four as well. And he's half a second down on Charles Leclerc after the first third of the lap. Leclerc quickest a 1 minute 33.1. Sainz second a 33.8. Ocon third a 34.5 and then Magnussen also a 34.5 all of these lap times are on the medium tyres in fact almost everyone has gone out on the mediums bar Lando Norris and Daniel Ricciardo so we saw McLaren do a different tyre strategy this morning uh, using the, the softs straight away and they're now on the hard tyres which is different to everyone else which will probably mean they all end up with the same tyres come the end but they're just doing it a, a little bit uh, backwards or the other way around let's say at McLaren as Sonoda is 1.6 seconds down after the middle sector is uh, not look neat and tidy this one it's been scrappy hasn't it but it's it's his first lap out there at night on the mediums let's see what he can do a little bit later Jack remember the times again they're just going to get quicker and quicker this might be a one-off lap or he might be uh, doing a call down next time going again I think you find don't you that quite a few people at the beginning to middle of this run will concentrate on long runs and then they'll do the, the push laps and the flying laps at the end. Yeah. Sam, quick question for you. As I watched George Russell in the garage down at Mercedes, obviously this is a new partnership between he and Lewis Hamilton now. A lot's been said about, oh, is he going to come in and is he going to be faster? You know, will he get in the way of the sort of nice flow that they have between Bottas and Hamilton? But uh, what I wanted to know from you is when it comes to feedback, Obviously, you rely on your teammate to give feedback, to develop a car over the weekend, to get it in, set up correctly. How much is that going to change things for Lewis Hamilton that he's not got Bottas there? He's got George Russell. It's his first year with Mercedes in the car. Is that going to unsettle potentially everything? I, I don't think so. Lewis, Lewis is experienced enough to know what he wants and what he requires from the racing car. Um, of course, Valtteri came in and had to learn Lewis's way effectively and, and George will have to do the same on on George Russell I was speaking with Jack actually last week about the the introduction of George and Jack asked me you know what what do you think it's going to be like how is he going to do is he going to you know put a shock on on Lewis and I think that that race that he did a couple of years ago here in Bahrain the pressure was off, it was a one-off race, and he could just race freely. Now he's got the contract, he has to deliver week in, week out. It's a completely different ball game. I can imagine the stress level this weekend will be quite high because now the pressure really is on him, and he does have to back Lewis up, and he does have to deliver big points all the time. Will he? He's clearly very, very good. Is he miles better than Valtteri? You know, has, have they replaced somebody with somebody miles better? I'm not sure yet. I don't know. Clearly, he's exceptionally talented, and he is one for the future. Time will tell whether he can really... And, uh, yeah, we're at the limit of uh, bouncing. I can feel it in the straight. Okay, okay. Copy that. On the limit of bouncing, so saying there's quite a lot of uh, porpoising, which we were discussing earlier on. Uh, you finish your... Yeah, as as I said, whether whether he can live with Lewis throughout the season, let's let's wait and see. Yeah, the one thing I would say about Russell is that he's done 
some things that make you go wow which if you're going to make it in Formula 1 even when you're in a poor car you do that all the greats have done that you know Hamilton, Alonso Schumacher whatever they all, they all did something that made your jaw drop and Russell did that a number of times in the Williams for example putting it second on the grid in Belgium in the wet last year ahead of Hamilton of all people um, which I don't think Bottas did to the same extent when before he got into a quick car he, he had one race in Canada where he did a really good qualifying but he didn't he looked really really solid like he had some really good potential but he didn't look like a potential superstar and Russell did now that's one thing it's another thing than being able to really go toe to toe with statistically the greatest Formula 1 driver in history um, you know that we don't have the answer to you know but will he do I think he'll be better than Bottas yes but that's not the same as saying he'll be as good as or better than Hamilton fascinating it's going to be really really interesting to see that over the course of the year Max Verstappen has set the fastest first sector of anyone uh, it was Formula 3 qualifying that we had in between FP1 and FP2 my apologies so all of you getting in touch having a go at me I'm very sorry including uh, Harry Benjamin the Formula 3 commentator has texted me saying it was qualifying didn't you watch no uh, but Van Amersfoort taking pole position uh, in their first race in the series with Franco Colapinto anyway Verstappen quickest in sector one reasonable through sector two and he's on the medium tyre and he splits the Ferraris half a second shy of Charles Leclerc but two tenths quicker than Carlos Sainz uh, Hamilton is now coming through the middle sector he's swinging into the left-hander of turn 11 oh, still bouncing a lot OK, copy and he's saying it's still bouncing a lot as he comes through the middle sector what's his lap time looking like Hamilton well he's he's fifth quickest at the moment uh, his last lap was a cool down lap I think he's doing a double cool because he's weaving around at the moment coming down the back straight a 34.3 is his personal best we'll have a look at him as he comes down the straight this time gets on the power out of turn 14 you can hear the sound of the Mercedes engine as he comes up through the gears Right at the end, you can you can hear, can't you? The All the way down the straight, Jack, and he, he's actually gone wide, and, and that lap will be scrapped because of a, a run wide at turn one. But all the way down the straight, you can see the car really bouncing up and down. I think, I mean, of all the cars, and again into three, of all the cars out there right now, I'd say I'd actually go as far to say as Lewis's in that porpoising effect area is looking the most extreme. Jenny. It just come down to Ferrari um, and slightly changing the subject, I appreciate that, but I've just watched them do a practice pit stop and I'm speaking to a couple of the engineers about it. We are expecting pit stops to slow down a little bit for the first few races. Shouldn't be too dramatic, but they're dealing with much different tyres. They're 18 inches, the car's heavier as well. So it's a different sort of process they've got to go through. A lot of them have changed some of their equipment to make sure it, it kind of is still balanced and works properly, but just watching the mechanics trying to do it. 22 people normally involved in a pit stop, and I tell you what, it does look like hard work now. Those tyres are just so big. <laughs> Overwhelming, I would suggest. Have you tried to pick one up? No, not yet, but I will. Um, if you can, yeah, come down and watch me struggle later. Let's get that done. <laughs> so one of the things that's interesting for me about the wheels and tyres is that they've gone for lower profile tyres this year. 18 inch wheels is what they use, which is what you would get on your sort of standard road car. In fact, the way road cars are going, they're sometimes even going for bigger wheels than that. Um, and you would expect that that means that the tires are much lower profile than they were last year, but they're not. They are, they are the sidewall is smaller, but it's nowhere near as much smaller as you would think it might have been. So they couldn't keep the same diameter of tire and then just increase the wheel rim. I was talking to Pirelli's Mario Isola about this yesterday, wandering down the paddock. I said, why aren't the sidewalls smaller? And he basically said they couldn't make the tyres safe using smaller tyre side, using smaller sidewalls. So they had to increase the overall diameter of tyre and wheel together, even though the sidewall is smaller than it used to be. Interesting. It is always interesting with the tyre that how much rubber there is that is never actually, you know, in contact with the 
with the ground, isn't it? Uh, just that's a general existential point about tyres. Russell coming through the first sector. He's coming up through turn four in the silver Mercedes. We'll get his first sector split compared to Charles Leclerc. And he's nearly half a second away from Leclerc. He is currently in 10th place, George Russell. Half a second slower than Lewis Hamilton. Hamilton is back in the pits. Quite a lot of the drivers are back in the pits. It's about half and half who's out and who's in. Leclerc, Verstappen, Sainz, Alonso, Hamilton is the top five at the moment. Ocon, Joe, Magnussen, Bottas, Russell, the top 10. Gasly, Sonoda, Schumacher, Norris, Stroll, the top 15. Ricardo, Hulkenberg, Latifi, Albon, the 19 drivers to have set the lap time. Sergio Perez has only just left the pits in the Red Bull. Uh, I think he might have done an install lap earlier on, but he's out on track now. And uh, we've got 44 and a half minutes to go. So it won't be too long, I wouldn't have thought, before we... Uh, stick a set of softs on, do some qualifying simulations and then get into the race runs in the second half of the session. Russell bouncing a bit as he comes down to the final corner at turn 14, out across the line. And Russell is currently 10th. Does he improve on this lap? No, he does not. So he remains in 10th position, went a 10th slower than he managed previously. It's a long, long way off for, for the Mercedes at the moment. So noticed on personal bests in the first two sectors. The Alpha Tauri coming into the final turn. 12th fastest at the moment. His teammate Pierre Gasly is just ahead of Sonoda in 11th place. He's returned to the pits. Sonoda comes across the line and he jumps up into sixth place just behind Lewis Hamilton. On Mercedes, again, people still thinking that they might be sandbagging or not showing their full potential. That's fine, don't show your full potential, but you'd probably only want to be a few tenths off. You, you wouldn't want to be looking at a second and a half. That, that's not sandbagging, that's, that's more than that, as we see Mick Schumacher locking up and running wide at turn one. Quite a big lock up that actually for Schumacher, that might harm his race run a little later on. Andrew? One of the interesting things in the background at Mercedes, and I'm not saying that this is necessarily relevant, but it, it, it may be, um, is that it's not only the rules that have changed quite a lot. At Mercedes, there have been a lot of changes in the last 12 months as well. Andy Cowell, who was the uh, engine boss uh, all the way through the hybrid era, he left last year, and it, the team's now run by a guy called Hewell Thomas, who was his deputy before. James Allison, who's been technical director since 2017, when he moved from Ferrari, who's very, very highly rated throughout Formula One. He's been promoted to a new role of chief technical officer and he's not as hands-on with Formula One anymore. And now Mike Elliott is the technical director. Now, you know, there's an extremely strong team at Mercedes, but, you know, who knows? Maybe we'll find down the line that that technical disruption also has had an effect on what's happened in this new set of rules. I don't know. It's just something that's in the background to keep, to keep, keep in mind for now, I think. What about the battle at the end of last season? Because there, there was a lot of discussion all the way through last year of when do you switch focus? All the teams basically said, that's not a thing anymore. We have enough people to, to do concurrent programs anyway. Do we still, we still buy that? That's, that's not a reason. Well, I think lots of people were saying, were Mercedes and Red Bull both going to be disadvantaged by that? Because obviously they were both developing their cars later in the season than some other teams. Haas, for example, basically haven't done any development on their last two-year cars. Well, Mercedes said they were stopping in the middle of the season and then... And then produced an update. Yes, yes exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Toto, there was a bit of miscommunication there from Total Wolf on that one. Um, but um, the other thing, I mean, yes, it's a good point, Jack. Has... Has that had an impact this year? Although it would appear that it hasn't had an impact on Red Bull, although certainly Ferrari have concentrated very, very much on getting this new set of regulations, which were initially planned for 2021, as right as can, because they realised they were behind last time. The other thing to bear in mind is the cost cap. Um, that was introduced last year at $145 million. It's come down by another $5 million this year to $140 million. There's also a sliding scale of aerodynamic research restrictions uh, in the sense that the team that finished last has the most available aerodynamic research and the team that finished first in the Constructors' Championship has the least available aerodynamic research. The idea is to, over time, bring the field closer together. Who know, Maybe that's had an impact too. There's all these different factors all swirling around. And, but all we know for sure right now, I think, I think we can say for sure, is that Mercedes are not on the absolute pace this year at the moment. 
but they, but it's not like they're not quite there. I mean, okay, this is, look, we're very early on, but it looks like they could even be sort of at the front end of the of the midfield. Uh, just getting a look at Alex Alban coming into turn one. Now he spun here on an outlap earlier on, and he's well, he had a half spin, and he's had another half spin this time on a on a push lap on the medium tyres. Alban as he put the throttle down the back end a uh, bit of a tank slapper really but he managed to get it back going again Jenny Gow yeah George Russell was interesting on this subject when I was speaking to him this morning he said that Mercedes have a great team obviously we hear that it's kind of the script from um, both drivers that they, they if anybody can find a solution they will be able to find a solution but he's also pointed out um, the fact that at the beginning of this season we have races spread out quite a lot yes we've got this as a double header with Saudi Arabia then we've got a gap to Australia then a gap after that to Imola so actually quite nice big spaces where they can go back do simulator work develop the car make new parts get them onto the car if they were starting with the congested calendar that we have at the end of this season where we've got six races in seven weeks then he said they would be in a world of pain but he sees it as being a marathon, not a sprint, and that they have time to find the weaknesses and to correct the weaknesses. Well, it's true. Long old, long old season, isn't it? As uh, we are on race one of 23. The only thing to bear in mind about that is that it's a long season, but if Verstappen's as consistent as he was last year, I mean, he never finished off out of first or second place pretty much, did he? Um, then it's still a mountain to, to climb for them. Um, although if Ferrari are up there with Red Bull, then that might sort of split the points a bit. And um, that's what we have to hope for, I think, is some kind of competition at the front, isn't it? it doesn't, you know, in terms of a, a show for everybody to watch, it doesn't really matter which teams are up there, does it? It's just as long as there are some of them closely matched together to dispute the race wins. 38 minutes to go. Nico Hülkenberg is coming towards the final corner now. I'm trying to remember what helmet he wore last time he raced in Formula 1 because he was wearing a black number when he was in his time with Renault in sort of 17 and 18. I don't remember oh, him. A, I think it was a black helmet with a yellow number or was it a yellow helmet with a black it number? It was black with like yellow with flashes. Yellow. I think he just wore a plain black or carbon helmet last time. Yeah, in Nürburgring. Yeah, purely a, a carbon helmet. Yeah, and so now he's got this, uh, this, white, uh, this white piece, which is... Very nice, very smart. If anybody knows, let us know. Yeah, hashtag BBCF1, if you can remember what Nico Hülkenberg's... It saves me Googling it, basically. Uh, Jenny? Yeah, I have a feeling he was there with work commitments, TV commitments, a little bit of Porsche stuff. And obviously he came in for qualifying and he didn't have his race lid with him. Couldn't get it. He was wearing really short um, suit as well because he, he's a very tall man and uh, nobody else is quite as tall as him. So everything that he was wearing was begged, borrowed or steeled, I believe, which is why he didn't have a proper race helmet with him. But it was an FIA tested one, which was the most important thing. So it was safe. It just wasn't very branded. I think, I think it was plain white. I think you're right. But well, I'm just imagining him trying to fit in my race suit. That would be a, <laughs> a heck of a thing. <laughs> if you're unaware, Sam... Oh, how am I going to... I've got myself in a hole here. Uh, just so people know that because we have to do Andrew Benson makes jokes about hair okay, go but on then. people on the go radio on, don't going? know that he has no hair so that that's the joke well, I'm vertically challenged <laughs> I was an extra on Lord of the Rings there we go <laughs> Jenny I was <laughs> It's going to make a serious point, actually. I don't know why I bother sometimes, but about the height differences of drivers and the fact that, for example, Bottas and Hamilton, always relatively similar height. However, George Russell's come in and the pictures of them walking down the pit lane together are great because Russell towers over his teammate, the same Alonso at Alpine and Ocon. Ocon towers over Alonso. In fact, I always forget how short Alonso. Are you taller than Alonso, Sam, or shorter? No, the only the, I'm only That's taller the gauge than Yuki. Now. But you see a, a very difference in body shape of a of a smaller driver. We can be a little bit more more stocky. We can carry a little bit more muscle. The taller drivers, they are skinny as a rake um, because they need they they can't afford to carry weight basically Nico I think one of the reasons why Nico Hülkenberg never got a top top drive is purely because of his size and his weight 35 minutes to go uh, that was the, uh, Justin Wilson especially was was a driver who who really suffered from that being being so tall 
Um, and there was one, who was it? Paul de Resta. Didn't Paul de Resta jump in to replace Felipe Massa at the Hungarian Grand Prix for Williams? And he only had Massa's shoes, which were about like three sizes too small or something like that. And his feet were like numb by the end of the Grand Prix. He couldn't feel it, apparently. Well, George Russell, when he substituted for, for Lewis here at that, um, the other strange setup. Uh, in Bahrain that the race that Sergio won his first Grand Prix yeah. George had to, to run with um, Lewis's boots that were two sizes too small and he said his, his, the, the big toe was absolutely numb after 10 or so laps I, don't, I, I, uh, I tend to not wedge my sh- feet into shoes that are too small well that's because you don't drive racing cars that are too small for you Jenny do you wedge your feet into shoes that are too small I think it's called this is it the Cinderella complex <laughs> don't do it you could cut the ends of the shoe off is it, did Jolien do that once someone has definitely cut the ends of no, their he, shoe he off he like shaved the back heel he had to like oh, shave the back it. heel bit um, like I just I just thought I'd update you that Lewis Hamilton has just been on a fresh pair of boots um, that's red uh, soft tyres do you and me and uh, he has now gone out on track so let's watch this space if they've been sandbagging we don't think they have but if they were uh, I expect this is a late in time that that suddenly gets a little bit more real yep well the soft lap times are coming in now they've all been into the pits they've come out on soft tyres Fernando Alonso is the first to set a time a 1 minute 32.877 in the Alpine he's gone fastest Sainz was about to go quicker but made a mistake at the final corner got out wide at turn 14 and 15 and as a result he ends up a tenth of a second slower than Fernando Alonso Charles Leclerc is on a lap currently Uh, so is Kevin Magnussen who might have I think the Hatters have done a lap already on the softs but they're on another one now and actually three tenths away from Alonso's lap time in the Alpine so this is going to be the next five or ten minutes which will be our, our closest illustration of what's going to happen in qualifying tomorrow with 33 minutes left on the clock Leclerc flying through the middle sector now swinging into the he's half a second up on Alonso big lap coming in then from Charles Leclerc Magnussen was improving in the first sector but he's lost a little bit of time in the second sector on this second lap on the soft tyres Leclerc in the Ferrari onto the brakes bouncing over the curbs on the inside he keeps it neat and tidy and Leclerc is now going to set the new benchmark which is a 1 minute 32.263 so Ferrari looking strong early on as I say Sainz made that mistake the Mercedes are out on circuit as Jenny said Max Verstappen is still in the pit so it'll be a while before we see him Sergio Perez is on an outlap now so benchmark laid down from Ferrari absolutely I'll tell you what though Jack Magnussen and Schumacher fourth and fifth I know it's early there's going to be people beating them but it's great to see them more competitive than they were last year I spoke to Peter Carolla in the pit lane earlier and the team atmosphere is really good at Haas considering everything that they've been through over the last few weeks they're really happy they, they, they believe that having Kevin there is a great benchmark for Mick and that this is only going to be a good thing for them moving forwards well I sort of don't want to be indelicate here, but I can see why morale, on the, on, on the one hand, you can see why morale would drop, right? But on the other hand, maybe you can see why morale would go up a little bit because it, you know, in uh, Mazepin's, not only the, the sort of geopolitical in, uh, incidents with the, you know, invasion of Ukraine, and but also Mazepin himself was sort of controversial at the start of last season with some of the things he, he got up to, controversial is a polite way of putting it. Then not really much pace last year. You can see why actually we're bringing in a proper driver in Kevin Magnussen, where, you know, all of those uh, clouds over our head are kind of gone, I suppose. Uh, Jack, I think it's also worth pointing out that there is no bones made about it. Mick did not get on with Nikita. Nikita didn't get on with Mick. There was a lot of unrest in that team and it was a constant battle for Gunter Steiner, the team principal, to get the two working together. And that's what they needed in that team, not two drivers, two rookie drivers at that, pulling in opposite directions. You know, Matt has been saying that he wasn't getting the good a car as Schumacher and then swapping chassis it was just very messy a very messy year for Haas they did no development on the car 
and you know they languished at the back there was no cheer there was no way of getting through that and now at least they are a, a happier team absolutely uh, a, a quick view on Hulk Hulkenberg used a plain carbon helmet at Silverstone and then a white helmet with pink flashes at, uh, at Silverstone uh, and the Nürburgring I believe Half an hour to go. Let's focus on these lap times as they come in because Sergio Perez, the Mexican for Red Bull, turns through the final corner. The scene, as Sam said earlier on, of his first Formula One Grand Prix victory. And Perez in the Red Bull cuts the timing beam and he is slower than Charles Leclerc and slower than Fernando Alonso and slower than Valtteri Bottas in the Alfa Romeo. We had traffic uh, at the end of Sector 2 approaching Sector 3, so expect there to be a few tents there. I don't think it was as good as lap of Charles Leclerc, but I think he should have settled into second there. Yeah, OK, so Perez fourth, Sainz fifth, and Verstappen is now on a lap. He's coming through the middle sector. He's exiting the left-hander at turn 10, and now along the back straight. The DRS wide open in that Red Bull rear wing, slams it shut as he swings into the left-hander of seven, minimum speed of about 94 miles an hour coming through the long left-hander. Now rising over the crest at turn 13 before the track drops away into the blind, tricky right-hander, and he's only a tenth up on Charles Leclerc after the middle sector. A tenth up nevertheless, but one more corner to go for Verstappen. Onto the brakes, down through the gears, 75 miles an hour through the final turn. Is Verstappen going to go to the top of the times? The reigning champion in the Red Bull does. Three tenths of a second quicker than Charles Leclerc's Ferrari. Fernando Alonso third, but there's a second from Verstappen in first to Alonso in third. As I said earlier, Lewis's car currently looking the worst with the porpoising and, and the bouncing around. For sure, Verstappen and the Red Bull, they look currently the best. Hamilton's been out on the soft tyres for, for quite a while, I think, since uh, Jenny reported he was heading out. He hasn't managed to get a lap in yet on them. He is doing one now, or a representative lap, I should say, on them. I think he did a... He obviously started one, then abandoned it, did a cool down, and is now going again. He's coming through turn 11. Both he and Russell are on track at the moment. Hamilton is about eight seconds up the road from Russell, and he's nine tenths down after the middle sector. This is this is midfield pace. The Hasses are still there in seventh and eighth. Here he comes into the final corner, gets on the power, comes out across the line, and Hamilton will find some lap time because he's currently down in 16th position. He goes up to eighth. He splits the Hasses. Mick Schumacher seventh, Hamilton eighth, Magnussen ninth, Russell a bit more like it, up into third place. That is much, much more encouraging for the Mercedes team. Six tenths away from Verstappen still, but the Hamilton lap time's nowhere. Well, we know that they're splitting the, the setup work, as it were, so there might be one car that is suited and one car that's not at the moment. Certainly, George looks a little bit more comfortable. Charles Leclerc is going quickly again. He's only five hundredths down on Verstappen after the middle sector. A little bit of a correction mid-corner at 13 now coming down towards the final turn. Verstappen has returned to the pit, so I think that run is enough for him. But Leclerc, on a second lap on these soft tyres, comes towards the line now, underneath the commentary box window, and he gets within a tenth. 0 0.087 Leclerc behind Verstappen. Ferrari looking strong, Red Bull looking strong, Mercedes six tenths adrift of those two at the moment. We'll see if Hamilton goes again. Uh, here's his radio. Okay, Roger, looking into it. The right front is pulling, says Hamilton. What does he mean by that? It means that every time he's getting on the brake, the front right has a tendency to snag and lock up. We saw it into turn one. Um, it might be them, there might be a little bit too much tape or something on the, on the blanking and they might be running at different temperatures for some reason, which is why it might cause a front lock, but he'll go in now, they'll sort it out, they'll suss it and they'll get it right. So, Verstappen fastest, Leclerc second, Russell third, Alonso's Alpine fourth, Bottas, Alfa Romeo fifth, Sergio Perez's Red Bull is sixth, seventh is Carlos Sainz in the Ferrari, eighth is Mick Schumacher in the Haas, ninth is Lewis Hamilton in the Mercedes, tenth is Kevin Magnussen in the other Haas. 
Norris, 11th. Ocon, 12th. Gasly, Sonoda, 11th and uh, 12th. Then you've got Joe Guan Yu in 15th place. Stroll and Hulkenberg. Ricardo, Latifi, Albert. That is the order. Andrew Benson. He's writing his uh, session report already. <laughs> but just to interrupt you there. Uh, obviously, the sort of Red Bull Ferrari is Mercedes is maybe about where we thought. But the midfield looks pretty jumbled as well. Uh, I would say that is probably where we thought. Um, it's a big gap, though, isn't it? So, first of all, a big gap between... Red Bull and, Mercedes, and Ferrari and then Mercedes uh, about what Mercedes have basically been implying it would be um, but then another big gap back to Alonso the head of the rest of the field if you like in uh, fourth place in the Alpine nine tenths you know that's basically the same gap that there was between the front runners and the midfield last year so closing up the field hasn't really worked has it <laughs> so far unfortunately I don't know why I'm laughing because um, if you didn't laugh you'd cry it's not funny is it <laughs> Um, but I tell you what, I mean, if this is a if this is a if this is a season that's a battle between Red Bull and Ferrari, I'm I'm well up for seeing Leclerc, oh, yeah. Leclerc against Verstappen. I think that's mouthwatering, and with Sainz in there as well. Hass, both Hasses in the top ten. Yeah, well, they've been looking good in testing, and they so they should be. I mean, they spent two years working on this car and nothing else, basically. Um, they are the smallest team, but that's a solid job from them. And just to pick up on that point, there was a very uh, what you, discussion you were having about Haas earlier. There was a very revealing. Uh, it was actually an official team tweet with a quote from Gunter Steiner, the team principal, the other day, where he was quoted saying, "We have a really good pairing now." <laughs> really? Um, I don't think there's any secret that no one really liked Nikita Mazepin very much as a person, or rated him very much as a driver. Uh, at Haas or anywhere else for that matter <laughs> I'll let you say the controversial stuff I'm not getting involved in that yeah this is, this is, this is that the, was Andrew Benson yeah the BBC's king of impartiality uh, 23 minutes to go I'm just reporting Jack <laughs> it's not my opinion <laughs> uh, into the uh, into the last 23 minutes of this session Lando Norris is still out on circuit now he's 8 tenths up on Ricardo. Uh, Ricardo's back in the pits Ricardo seems a bit too far off. I mean, I said that a lot last year, but a bit too far off to have done a sort of proper lap time. Williams seem a little adrift. Again, early stages, but they are not in the midfield fight in, in sort of any way at the moment in these early stages. The same is kind of true of Aston Martin as well. So we'll see what happens there because obviously a load of... Actually, Aston Martin, Andrew, I'm going to ask you, they've, they've put a load of investment in recently building a new factory etc etc and obviously it's it's a long-term project but with the rule was this rule change too soon for them in a way well they haven't got their all singing all dancing high-tech factory on stream yet that's another year away exactly yeah so but even so you know they're you know they like to pride themselves on punching above their weight um have done for years now they keep talking about that now as it's a great team that always punched above its weight so imagine what we can do with the right resources so if 16th and 17th which is where Lance Stroll and Nico Hulkenberg are at the moment is a fair reflection of their car's potential they will be disappointed with that I think we have to bear in mind Sebastian Vettel's not here um, Nico Hulkenberg's not driven the car before and he hasn't done a run on the soft tyre yet either so it would be wrong to jump to conclusions right now yeah, but as well, we have to remember throwing money at something doesn't always mean you're going to succeed. Look at BMW back in the day when they came in. Did they did they actually ever really win win anything big? They 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 came close, but it wasn't the case. So uh, you know they've got this all singing all dancing factory coming up. Um, Sauber obviously had the wind tunnel. Anything that went in there didn't seem to go particularly well. So. It doesn't mean that they're going to be a surefire thing of winning in the future. No, of course, but it it reassesses how you judge them. You yeah. know, if you're in yes. the midfield, when they were Force India, they were always punching above their weight, doing a good job. Yeah. If they've got all this investment and stuff, and then you don't make any progress, then that becomes underperformance. That's true. Uh, 21 minutes to go. Carlos Sainz out on the soft tyres. What I'm interested in, again, if, if this is a battle here of Red Bull versus Ferrari, so you've obviously got this, as, as, as was said, 
eye-watering eye -watering battle between Verstappen and Leclerc. Who wins the battle for the, let's call it, number two drivers between Perez and Sainz? Who's got the stronger team going into this race? Who backs who up the best? Sainz. 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 <laughs> cool. It's a good effort to sort of make conversation and stuff. I'm sorry we shot it down. So it's all right. No, it's, it's fine. I, you know, I'm just I'm here just to make the conversation. Well, I think science impressed a lot of people last year, including myself, with how close he was. Who's that. won a race here? Perez. There we go. Jenny has not won a race here. I'm uh, I'm bringing I'm throwing you I'm throwing it to you. Oh, I, I was going to say I almost did, but no, because <laughs> I'm not an F1 driver. Um, I was just going to say that Science has been incredibly impressive and I think there are some that are saying he could be fancied for the championship if Ferrari could produce a car that was as good or better than uh, you know their key rivals in, in Red Bull and Mercedes and a lot of people get very excited when you talk about Carlos Sainz Jr and the fact that yeah he could he could beat Charles Leclerc and he could go out there and win the world title and I think it's one of the only teams up and down the pit lane as Latifi goes out in the Williams impressively skidding around um, who have um, a, a, a double chance of winning a championship with either driver there aren't that many teams that can say that I don't think Red Bull could say that Sainz has just gone third quickest as well so he's managed to improve again as uh, Carlos Sainz I'd be I'd be you know, I, I know he beat Leclerc over the course of the season last year, but I would, I, I would be, uh, in terms of points, but I, I would be remarkable. It would be remarkable if he was able to, to beat him to sort of a, a championship. But you're right in that. Well, we don't, don't know with Mercedes yet, but they are very well matched. Uh, Leclerc and Sainz. Verstappen is fastest. Leclerc second. Sainz now third. Uh, he managed to get ahead of George Russell by nine thousandths of a second. Alonso is fifth. Bottas, Perez, Schumacher, Hamilton and Magnus in the top ten. It is... Um, uh, Hamilton has DRS issues, uh, according to, to the team on, on social media. So he didn't have his DRS open on the, on the straight. So that's losing him a big old chunk of time. Maybe the six-tenths of a second that it is to, to George Russell. I don't know the exact figure, but that certainly explains quite how little pace uh, Hamilton has had down in, in ninth place at the moment with uh, less than 18 minutes to go. Uh, Zach Brown watching on in the McLaren garage, having a little chat to Daniel Ricciardo with Ricciardo's car up on the stands at the moment. He's still in the pit lane. His teammate Lando Norris is out on circuit on the soft tyres as we move into the sort of long run phase of the uh, of the session now. Verstappen quickest, Leclerc second, Sainz third, Russell fourth, Alonso fifth, Bottas, Perez, Schumacher, Hamilton, Magnus in the top ten. Norris, Ocon, Gasly, Sonoda and Joe the top 15. Stroll, Hulkenberg, Ricardo, Latifi and Albon the 20 drivers. 2.7 seconds splitting front to back. And... As I say, we'll bring you some long run info a little bit later on in the in the session. But Verstappen now coming into turn one with the number one on his car. Would you take number one? I think I would. You're I a bit actually. You're a you. I think I would. But you changed your Formula E number, didn't you? I did. I did because uh, so I was. If you don't want to tell the story, that's no, fine. No, no, no. That's I absolutely I fine. No, I, like a, um, so if people don't know, I used to be number two. Um, in Formula E and there were too many jokes of our number two number two driver and then there's also the joke about the fact that I'd start every weekend as the first name on the leaderboard now there's only one place you can go from there especially in Formula E I mean it's, it's so hit and miss uh, so I just fancied a change to be honest Jack I thought the number 10 was, was a decent number no, no it's a lovely number I'm not, I'm not knocking it but you'd take number one all the time I think if I were to win the, the Formula E World Championship, I would take uh, number one because you don't know whether you're ever going to win it again. I'd love that feeling of, of wearing that number one. I'd wear it with pride, absolutely. I get, I get why some other drivers don't want to do that, but certainly I would, I would want that number on my car. What's your favourite number if you've got a free choice? Right now, it's got to be number 10. 
because okay. that's what I'm running. Yeah, yeah. But, so, okay. but um, do you know, when I was karting, I ran number 41. I've always thought maybe I should run with number 41. Uh, I don't think we've... I don't think we've had number 41 in Formula 1. Might be available. Uh, Jenny? Yeah, I just remember when Max Verstappen was asked about it. He's such a canny, smart guy. He's like, well, it's a great opportunity to sell more merchandise, isn't it? If I stay with the same number, nobody buys new stuff. But if I flip to a number one, then everybody has to go out and buy new stuff if they're supporting me. So double the money. <laughs> smart cookie. Uh, just standing in front of Daniel Ricciardo's McLaren there, taking the floor off that car. Um, he's talking to Tom Stallard, his race engineer, in the middle with his helmet off. So clearly they're having an issue. And I tell you what, they've taken off the covers from the engine and uh, all of a sudden people are swooping down to take photographs because that's not the part that you normally get to see. You can really see what they've done with the internals of the car, how they've organised it, the bits that are homologated and are standard, the bits that they can play around with. There's all sorts going on in the back of that car. Really fascinating to get a chance to have a look. If only I knew more about cars. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, it's same for me as well, as uh, you tell me all the time on hashtag BBCF1. A really good question here. Maybe there'll be an obvious answer. Benson, you've got to listen to this. Uh, Rimal says, talking... No, you just have to listen and then think about it. Uh, talking of sites competing for the Drivers' Championship, who was the last driver who won the championship without already having been a race winner before his championship season started? That's a great question. I love that. Hashtag BBCF1. Get in touch. Uh, Kaylee says, what would the BBC F1 guys race number B? Mine would be number 29 because of Dean Sturridge for Wolves. He was my favourite striker. So I ra on, when I race in eSports, I'm number 29. Jenny, what would your race number be? Uh, probably 20, although I understand that Kevin Magnussen has stolen that back off me now that he's come back to F1. Um, but 20 because it's my date of my birth. Okay. And Mitch Evans' number. And Mitch Evans' number. Go. Andrew Benson? I don't know, I was going to say Keki Rosberg to your answer before, to your question before. Is that the right answer? I don't, uh, we don't know the answer, but yeah, maybe. He, he only won one race that year, didn't he? Yeah, he certainly hadn't won before. Yeah, had he not? Okay, there's your answer. 1982? Keki Rosberg. But you don't have a, a favourite number, Andrew? No, he's not even bothering to pick up his microphone and say no, he's just shaking his head. We've missed this, haven't we, ladies and gentlemen? Pulling teeth. 13 minutes to go. Across the line comes Mick Schumacher, bouncing his way down towards the uh, down towards the first corner. As we were saying earlier on, a, 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 a big year coming up for for Mick to, to prove himself against Magnussen. But FP2, he's ahead by a tenth or two. Not too bad. And he now has a car where he can actually do something and race some other people, bar being on his own at the back, which we'll see a different skill set from him no it's it's true like last year him and nikita unfortunately were propping up the back and they couldn't challenge anybody realistically um after the first two laps this year he'll be able to get stuck in let's see what he can do in a race environment can he can he move forwards can he is his race craft as good as what it was in formula two i've just been told the reason behind your number 10 is so you can just peel the zero off on the inlap well I didn't want to say anything of course <laughs> is that from Diane Bird as well <laughs> no <laughs> uh, Mr Lane Mr Stephen Lane yeah Sam hashtag eyes forwards in formulary 11 and a half minutes to go Jenny yeah more gremlin is in the works for McLaren unfortunately they suffered from brake problems through the last test now they've got another problem it's a water leak that's ended Daniel Ricciardo's session early so, team looking at that. Oh, crikey, that was a huge lock-up. Who was that coming in? It was Kevin Magnussen in the number 20. Came into the pit lane, slammed on the anchors. Huge plume of smoke comes up and from the tyres locking up. But he actually, it was rocking and rolling all over the place, um, the front end of that. So, a little lack of stability there, I think. But he wanted to uh, apply brakes. He applied the brakes hard. Uh, Adrian King agrees. He reckons it was Keki Rosberg. Old man yells at Cloud, says Jack Villeneuve. Uh, Villeneuve won a few races in 1996 before he won his uh, championship in 1997. So I think we've got the answer there pretty swiftly. Uh, <laughs> Stu G says, 
nobody's chosen number 41 yet in uh, Formula One. Apparently, Susie Wolf used it when she did free practice one, but it was used when the entry list uh, was 40 cars big. And here's a picture of Joachim Winkelhock with the number 41 on his car in the in the 80s. Thank you, Susie. 10 minutes to go. Uh, 15 years today since Lewis Hamilton made his Formula One debut at the Australian Grand Prix. Around the outside of Fernando Alonso at the first corner. And that's kind of what Andrew was talking about earlier on. So many of these drivers did something that made you go wow in that, in that first season. And for me, the only exception in terms of champions over recent years is Fernando Alonso. Because I'm sure he was amazing in his Minardi. Well, what about Nico Rosberg as well? He got his fastest lap year. on his debut in Bahrain. It's not stunning, but it was a bit of a, oh, hello. That's all right. Whereas I know Alonso would have been amazing in that Minardi, but in that first year, he, never, he didn't win a race in a Minardi like Vettel did. And that sort of, I know, I know, I know. I'm just winding Andrew up now. He's furious at me. But so many, you know, Schumacher coming in and qualifying like he did. Uh, hacking and out qualifying Senna all of those kind of uh, things were remarkable Hamilton first lap around the outside of Alonso they all have these kind of moments don't they it was clear from when Lewis first jumped in anything with four wheels that he was going to be special and that's why McLaren recognised that from an early age and he was groomed to be a world champion and, he, and he's and he's done exactly that and he has become um, dare I say it, in my eyes the greatest racing driver of all time that, that's certainly how I feel I'm very proud that he's a British driver I'm very proud that he's done what he's been able to do when I knew him and I was the reserve he was a different animal to what he is today now I think he's grown into the superstar that he is he acknowledges he's won all these races back then he'd only won one championship and was still trying to prove himself now it's, it's a different person that you see and was he as, as, as impressive on the inside as, as, as you would expect? Yeah, I, I was constantly starstruck. <laughs> um, but it was the, it was the his ability. I, I, I'm not shy in saying this. I can't do what Lewis Hamilton does in a racing car. His ability under braking and to, to perfect each corner is incredible. He can do some of the corners, but his, his relentlessness is, is unparalleled to anything I've ever seen before. Jenny? George Russell was talking about him today, actually. And of course, the question everybody wants to know is, oh, what's it like working with Lewis? Are you, know, are you worried? What's it, what's it going to be? Uh, and he just said that the, the thing he's been impressed by most is his hard work. He said a lot of people think Lewis just shows up, drives an amazing lap, goes home, you know, comes back, wins a race, jets off and does some, something else with his life. But actually, he's incredibly studious. He spends a long time with his mechanics, a long time with the engineers, poring over data. He analyzes everything. He's got a notebook that he writes everything down in. He isn't just a, I'll turn up and drive fast guy. He works tirelessly to make sure he can do that. And George Russell was saying, I think people underestimate him because they think he, he does just turn up and drive. Well, he's uh, ninth quickest at the moment, Lewis Hamilton. Russell fourth quickest, but there seems to be some trouble with uh, with his DRS, Hamilton. Leclerc is back in the pits, and I mean, both Ferraris went back into the pits, and Leclerc appears to be just sitting around. Daniel Ricciardo had to come in earlier on because of a uh, water leak, and so they're fixing that on the McLaren, so that's why he's in the pit lane. But Charles Leclerc is in the pits and just seems to not be doing a, a huge amount just sitting waiting to go out again he's just been held up a little by Yuki Tsunoda coming into turn 8 in the long runs it's um, less of a big deal but he seemed a little bit frustrated as uh, Leclerc is in the pits and it is Verstappen who's quickest Leclerc second science third Okay, everybody, so we have six minutes left of free practice two. So for the first time this season, it's time for this. Long Run Corner with Andrew Benson. You can go the distance, we'll find out.
I'm a little bit disappointed the producers not come up with a new jingle for this season. <laughs> <laughs> it's the best jingle in radio. <laughs> it doesn't need changing. Anyway, look, for anyone wanting close competition this year, I've got some bad news. The Red Bull looks unbelievably fast. Really? Yeah. Uh, Verstappen's done a few laps. He's averaging 37.1 minute, 37.3. Um, Russell's averaging 30, 1 minute 38.3 oh. um, we haven't got a time from Ferrari yet because uh, Leclerc did 2 1 minute 41s which can't be representative and then came into the pits and is still there Carlos Sainz has done one lap his first lap on the same soft tyres that uh, Verstappen and Perez are using is a 38.6 which is again a second off the Red Bull so just on the evidence of the race simulation runs today this evening the Red Bull appears to be a second lap faster than anything else now I can't believe I really hope that's not true for the sake of a competitive season but that's what the numbers say at the moment presumably they could be running they could be doing three quarters tank of fuel or, or, or something similar because the other thing we have to take into account this year is you can start the, 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 the Q2 rule is gone in that you have to start the tire, you have to start the race on the tire that you qualified on. So is that going to distort the way people start the race, and therefore what you're going to do when you're doing these long runs? Well, if they're doing a race simulation, so you would expect them to start with the same plan that they would use last year, which was effectively fill the car up for this first stint, which is the first stint simulation that they're doing now. So in theory, they should fill the car up fit the tyres that they may use at the start of the race, see how it goes. Why are you so decisive in saying this is a first stint simulation? Because my point is thus. But that's just what they normally do. I'm not saying Correct. it definitely is, but that's how they would normally do it. Because you knew you wanted to start on the soft tyre, you've just done your quali representation, so it all kind of works that way. But if you are, if you know today you want to start on the mediums, as an example, yeah. You could, you could simulate your second stint by having less fuel yeah, in the maybe, car, for yeah, example. Yeah, they could be doing a... They might be pretending to already done, have already done 20 laps and then testing that. Yeah. But it would be unusual to do that, especially at the first race of the season. But then they were in Bahrain last week and they could have been running full tanks all last week as well. I don't know. I mean, the Ferrari and the Red Bull look really close, all through testing and on short runs today. So you wouldn't have thought that there could be that much between them on uh, race pace, but that's what the numbers say at the moment. That's all I can tell you. No, no, I mean. Would you say in more recent history, though, that Ferrari, in terms of especially on its tyres, have been nowhere near as good as, as Red Bull for a long pace run? They certainly seemed the last couple of years to get through tyres at a much faster rate than their immediate opponents it would depend on the race Sam you know they I mean they just weren't as quick generally I mean there were races where they got through the tyres a lot at the beginning of last year for sure but then one of the drives of last season actually was Charles Leclerc doing you know a long stint uh, race at Silverstone on uh, a set of tyres and he very nearly held off okay Hamilton had a penalty but he very nearly won that race uh, doing something like that and um, so I wouldn't say necessarily and look, look I'm not trying to pour cold water on the season already I'm just telling you what the numbers have said today this after, this evening on these runs but you don't you know don't take them as absolute gospel but it's not a great sign ooh a gospel long run corner maybe that's maybe that's what we need uh, a minute and a half left already of the session uh, the Leclerc Sonoda incident is now under investigation by already I mean that's that's gone quickly as uh, Leclerc comes out of the final corner on the soft tyres, but a lot of running on the on the softs actually in this um, in this second half of the session. We've got uh, sort of four or five or six cars on the mediums, but but predominantly softs by the looks of it, Andrew. Uh, yeah, and I've just got an update because Leclerc has Ooh. now Leclerc has now come out on his soft tyres on what we assume is a similar race fuel load to Red Bull, and he's going every bit as quick as the as the Rebels are. So that's few <laughs> in terms of the overall competition so it is going to be thanks, close again uh, yes thank okay, goodness good. for that yeah it's a roller coaster forget, of emotions forget andrew everything benson, i said <laughs> andrew benson is a roller coaster of emotions one he's pouring water on the fire then he's saying oh no it's great again it's fantastic 
you never know what you're going to get. 35 seconds to go. So yeah, Leclerc's just done a 1 minute 37.169, which uh, compares to Verstappen's low 1 minute 37s. And then the Mercedes were in the low 1 minute 38. So it certainly looks as though a Ferrari versus Red Bull fight, which is going to be uh, tremendous come qualifying tomorrow in about, what, 24 hours time. Uh, Rob, Rob Colley says, unfortunately, we take the long run stuff as gospel. So there we go. Uh, Alonso through the final corner in his pink Alpine. Fifth place for Alpine, which is uh, decent for them. Checker flag is out. Because we haven't, I mean, we haven't got stuck into Alonso too much, but just a little bit here, because his, his coming back to Formula One was all about this season, Andrew. Yeah, and wouldn't it be great if he had a decent car? You know, he's, he's, he's just, he's just, he's just action, isn't he? He's just, a, he's... Well, even at the start of Qatar last oh, year, it was it, just super that, that was one of the drives of the season, that race, finishing on the podium in that car there. Unbelievable. But yeah, he just, he just makes things happen. He's just, he's just a walking story. And um, he's been like that for the best part of 20 years. And uh, if he was at the front again this year, well, he's also a fantastic racer. So if he was at the front, that would be great. It doesn't look like they're quite at the front, but the, it's, it's good. And the Alf, also worth shouting out about the, the Alfa Romeo. Uh, Al, Valtteri Bottas there in sixth place. That's done some pretty decent times. It looks not bad on the race simulations either. So it's encouraging for them. So, check a flag out. The order ends thus. Max Verstappen fastest to 1 minute 31.936, but less than a tenth ahead of Charles Leclerc in the Ferrari. Carlos Sainz in the other Ferrari is third. George Russell is fourth in the Mercedes, six tenths away from Verstappen. Alonso fifth, Bottas sixth, Perez, Schumacher, Hamilton and Magnussen, the rest of the top ten. Norris eleventh, Ocon twelfth, Gasly thirteenth, fourteenth for Sonoda, fifteenth for Joe. Stroll, Hulkenberg, Ricardo, Latifi and Albon, the 20 drivers. So that was it, the first day of running of the 2022 season. Two hours have gone just like that. And Jack, this is the only representative session before they go into qualifying. Free practice one, of course, done in blazing sunshine. I have a sunburn on to prove it. Free practice three will be done ahead of time as well in, in sunshine, even hotter tomorrow. So. The information that they've garnered from this, pretty important, isn't it? Just one arm. Yeah. <laughs> you know me, I can't get a conventional suntan or even a conventional sunburn. It's it's the arm that doesn't carry the microphone. Don't get it. Okay. Uh, but yes, point being, very, very interesting. I think it's now pretty much confirmed what we sort of thought from testing. Red Bull and Ferrari look very close. Mercedes are adrift ahead of the midfield by the looks of it sort of fairly comfortably with with george russell so they could be in for sort of a fairly lonely season M oh, mercedes Jack, but i gotta interrupt you fernando alonso is taking to the grid because they're doing their practice starts he put himself in pole position having a little hustle down to the start line i think against nico hulkenberg they're having a little drag race of it i love it <laughs> yes has that got andrew benson very excited uh we possibly possibly who knows possibly. who knows it's always a roller coaster of emotion isn't it yes Absolutely. Sorry, I cut across you, but I think you've made, you've made your point by then, no? Yeah. Yeah, fine. Um, so I want to ask you, who are the worried teams right now? Who are the drivers going, oh, oh this isn't going well? For me, I, th I think McLaren. I think McLaren uh, come away from today thinking, oh, we're not, we're not where we want to be. Um, I think Williams, um, I think they would have been hoping for a lot more from today and clearly Mercedes as well, Jenny. That's that's the three that I take away from this as being lots of work to be done. Yeah, Willi Williams are kind of miles away. Two and a half seconds Latifi off, off that pace and he's seven tenths off the sort of midfield, the back end of the midfield. Yeah, they look like they're in a world of pain right now, don't they? Um, I was just going to say, I think when people look at the timesheets today, they'll go, oh, Russell, Mercedes fourth, Hamilton ninth. But Sam, there was a there was a reason that Hamilton was struggling above and kind of beyond what was expected. There was. So he's had the DRS issue, which is why there's this big time offset compared to George. They've also, as, as I've said, they've been trying different components on the floor. Well, completely different floors, to be honest. Um, but you can see the Mercedes is bouncing around and porpoising a lot more than others. Others, when they go over these bumpy phases of the track and when they get into this porpoising phase, the, the frequency 
of the bouncing is much, much less so than what we're seeing on the Mercedes. It's a very violent movement up and down, whereas other people don't ha seem to have this. I think it would make me car sick, like really badly car sick. Uh, right, that's all we've got time for. Why, well, thanks to Sam, to Jack as well. Um, if you want to join us tomorrow, please do. FP3 gets underway, I think, midday your time. Uh, we've also got qualifying that goes off 6 o'clock here, 3 o'clock your time. This has been an IMG production for BBC Radio 5 Live. Listen out for a podcast later on tonight.